Hey everyone, welcome. This is, uh, well, so it's day three of our coverage for the Open Source Summit, but we started a day early, so it's actually day two officially of uh, Linux Foundation's Open Source Summit here in, in Austin. And I'm really happy to be joined by two friends of mine. Well, one, one's a new friend, one's an old friend. It's not that he's old, but I know him <laughs> a long time. Let me first of all introduce you to my friend Liam Randall from Cosmonic. Liam, welcome, man. It's great it's to have you. It's so great to be back on TechStrong. I love coming on. It's always a great conversation. I'm so excited about today. Absolutely. But this is the first time we're doing an in-person. That's right. We've done a few uh, virtual the last few years, but it's, it's great to be it's back good together. good to be back, yeah. Um, just real quickly, be before we jump into things, we are in person. We were in person at RSA, and you know we had a lot of folks, unfortunately, contract COVID. I will tell you that I think overall, the Linux Foundation's done a really nice job here. I mean, we're not wearing masks right now, but I have masks in my pocket. I'm sure the both of you do. When you're walking here, you're wearing masks. They're checking temperatures. I mean, look, nothing's perfect, but um, I'm, I was... Yeah, happy. look, I, I think the Linux Foundation truly embraces their mission of being community first. Yep. You know, it's an open source company. Uh, it's built um, a, together. And I think that I know that they work very closely with major stakeholders uh, in their ecosystem to craft policies that put the safety and health of all the attendees first. Yep. So, so kudos to them for that. Um, so we've got Liam. Carl, I, I'm blanking your Colin list. Murphy. Colin Murphy. And Colin is with Adobe. Uh, actually, why don't you introduce oh, yeah. yourself, so Colin? I'm Go ahead. Colin Murphy. I'm a senior software engineer at Adobe. I'm the CC web team, um, so some upcoming um, creative products. But before that, I was in Document Cloud for a number of years. A excellent. And of course, CC web is the creative cloud right. you know, web team. Yeah. I'm a customer. <laughs> um, but anyway, the reason we, we have two folks here is I want to discuss something that's, you know, we've seen it kind of percolating here at, at Open Source Summit this year. Um, look, we are 15 years into the web shift and lift. Some of it's cloud native, whatever. But we are, you know, just when we start getting our heads around that, we're starting to see the, uh, the, the edge, right? The horizon as kind of the new frontier. And it promises amazing things. I had a discussion with Liam yesterday. We uh, recently did an event in Philadelphia, of all places, with a, a gentleman from Horizon who runs their 5G commercial practice, and he was all about the edge. Yeah. And it really opened my eyes to what a game changer this is. Yeah, I mean, uh, the industry's really been driven forward by these enduring themes and technology of the last mm -hmm. 20 years. And if we think of them as layers of a cake, you know, the first was virtualization. And that started with VMware and paved the way for the first epic of cloud computing. But especially with containerization, I love your term, we really were riding this great lift and shift into the cloud. Uh, you know, closing down data centers, moving together virtualized assets. But the next epic of computing, I think, is clearly defined by this great opportunity to bring our computing out towards the data, towards the edge and the users. And there's a huge array of factors that are lining up um, in order to drive that story. Regulation, limited and deliberate autonomy, uh, privacy, performance, um, the edge is where the data is. Uh, so we have all of these things strategically looking ahead. And I think it's going to be the theme that comes to dominate the next 10 years of computing. Absolutely. So I'm a little older than you, even before virtualization. I remember when we first got the uh, the TCP stack. That's right. <laughs> I remember that. You know what I mean? What a revelation that was. Look, my first project as a network engineer was migrating NetBuoy and IPX SPX to TCP IP. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, you know, if you haven't, you know, routed more than one protocol in your life, you know, I think you, know, you should you take a step back. Absolutely. You know? those, those, it was hard, but it wasn't that hard in, yeah. when, as I look back on it. Anyway... <laughs> Um, Are we going to trade config that system? No, no, no. Know, let's I know not how to make your EMM 386. Yeah, that's it. Hum, hum. You know, yeah. <laughs> I remember those. Th th I had Zenith machine. Anyway, let's not even go down that path because we'll be here all day. Um, but y another important thing I just want to make sure our audience recognizes is when we talk about data on the edge and users, those users and that data is not necessarily generated from people. The, right. You know, the I.O., I, I think one of the big things about the edge is that's where these I.O.T. devices are going to live. Sure. And 
to quote Carl Sagan, right? There's billions and billions of them. Absolutely. And that's going to generate mind-boggling amounts of data. It yeah. does generate mind-boggling amounts of data. And, and where are we going to process that, store it, analyze it, work right. with it? Or, or, yeah, exactly. So that's, that's the big thing. And I'm actually going to have a talk in about a half an hour about this is one of the main use cases that, would be, that's, that we're looking forward to at Adobe is, um, is, co is around collaborative editing and machine learning at the edge. And you don't need to send everything back to the data center. Because that's expensive, right? That's that's one of you know, we if you have a, if you're at scale, every you know every megabyte coming into your data center it costs every, money. It costs money and uh, and the compute. And so if we can take advantage of edge where where network is cheap, right, and uh, and low latency, and then we can kind of send what we only really what we need back to the data center is the idea. Yeah. So I I, I think that is one of the um, kind of trigger questions we need to be able to figure out which is what stays at the edge, what goes back to the, to the cloud. And I'll give you something else. I've spoken to some companies who do sort of like data analysis on the fly mm -hmm. for, for data. There may be a thing where maybe you don't, do we need to keep every byte of data? Well, whether it's on the edge in the cloud or on someone's machine, right? right. Are, we, are we kind of wearing belts and suspenders by keeping the amounts of data we have? Well, I think it looks like uh, you know a set of uh, you know bandpass filters or you know sieves that you're passing data through. You know, when you think about like your Nest doorbell, for example, you know you're not streaming 100% of the video bandwidth back. You know, on that device, there's clearly some lightweight machine learning models that are doing initial detection of, of for example, maybe a face, and then when you identify those trigger. Uh, you know, pieces of data that you filtered out, those can get passed up to more advanced machine learning in the cloud. To, to build on Colin's point, I think it looks like a pyramid where yeah. you know, we have an incredible array of data here, but we can only choose to pass and process so much across um, as we move up the stack um, and up the cost stack too, as, right. we, as we think about that analogy probably holds pretty well. Absolutely. So, Colin spoke a little bit about the uh, Adobe's interest in this. What about Cosmonic? Well, Cosmonic was founded on um, on the you know, trying to figure out a way to build software easier on this enduring theme. And a few years ago, I was working at a large FI. I was a uh, uh, VP of innovation at Capital One. Mm -hmm. And we looked across our technical portfolio and we saw an opportunity um, to really um, address um, how we build distributed software. Uh, so we open sourced and uh, started to build a real community around what's now called Wasm Cloud. And Wasm Cloud is in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It's an incredibly fast growing um, uh, open source project whose users include Adobe, BMW. We've got huge contributions from Capital One, Deutsche Telekom, uh, and a huge array of companies that transcend industry. Uh, and as a framework, what it does is it, it takes this distributed edge and it gives you uh, the ability to write software that can seamlessly move across it. Um, it transcends devices, operating systems, browsers, CPUs, um, and, but it gives the, the developer the opportunity to just work on their hard problem that matters, their business logic. BMW, for example, is using it to run machine learning models in their cars, and what they love about it is it gives them the ability to pull those same models back into their Kubernetes or their clouds. Wasm Cloud operates um, compatibly with all of those things, Nomad, Kubernetes, um, et cetera. So Cosmonic um, is built on top of Wasm Cloud and is providing a platform as a service uh, for that community of people that see this opportunity and are working to address it in their own organizations. Got it. Just for, you know, sometimes we talk and, and people are following this, but there's, yeah. there's no links at the bottom of our live coverage. Wasm Cloud, where can they get more information? Uh, WasmCloud.com uh, uh, has links to our community calendar. Today is actually Wasm Cloud Wednesday, so we have our community call at 1 Eastern today. Um, uh, we list all of our conferences there. We've actually got links to live walkthroughs and labs at labs.cosmonic.com, where you can get hands-on without installing any of this. Uh, we also maintain a really active developer community at wasmcloud.dev. And as a part of the CNCF, um, there's transparent uh, community governance here. So you can see who are contributors, 
contributors are, you can see um, who's involved, uh, where contri contributions are coming from, and really understand the community. And it's really a, a, a community that transcends our core team. There's a, a less than 10 of us at Cosmonic today. Um, uh, however, there's over 120 contributors to the right. core of Wasm Cloud. So it's right. a, an idea that definitely transcends us and what we're doing. I, I got to get a little elementary with them for one okay. second. Again, we're on video. Can you spell WASM for them? Sure, it's just <laughs> W-A-S-M. It's, uh, it's just short for WebAssembly is abbreviated as WASM. Uh, okay. And I think WebAssembly is maybe one of the next things we could probably talk about because well, I know that, that term we've just, segue. we've just kind of thrown out here. Yeah, but we're, and we're going to dive into it, but I've, I've got to give Tom a chance. Go ahead. Oh, just talk, start, starting off on WebAssembly? No, well, oh. no, but you were going to say something before I asked Liam to uh, spell WASM. Oh, no, I was just going to say... Uh, you know, no, I, I don't even remember. <laughs> we you know, it happens. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I, I tend to do that to people. No, it's fine. Me. I, I was all geared up for WebAssembly. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, we're ready to jump <laughs> into WebAssembly. Well, I just want to, again, I don't want to put you on the spot with Adobe, but Adobe's a user of Wasm Cloud. Uh, well, we're not. Not, not in production. We've, we've, um, but we've definitely done some evaluations, and we've, and I'm, I've, we've had a lot of meetings with Liam. I mean, we've had, you know, it's been really productive. Um, I was just kind of kind of saying, the nice thing is that we have we have the uh, this web assembly is part of the W three, right. um, and then but then we have this this kind of if we if we once we talk about that we have to kind of talk about uh, WASI and the Bytecode Alliance and WASM time and and that's where Liam's stuff is really that's what Liam's stuff's really about and it's uh, it's a really fantastic community. Um, and so it's it's funny you have to kind of peel back this onion to get to. It sounds like yeah we've, we've got we a couple to, more layers. Yeah. But at the heart of it is this web assembly, right? That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, look, the, the industry has tried to address this right once, run everywhere problem before. I mean, we've all heard of Java, heard Silverlight, yeah. Flash. And those were good ideas um, <laughs> at, at, a, at a conceptual level, except they were driven by you know, dominant industry players. And that meant that they weren't standards. They, weren't, uh, they came as plugins. Um, and there was a sort of competitive element. And just as and I think being at Open Source Summit is a great way to talk about collaboration and community and better together. And when we think about the successes of Linux and MySQL and Wasm Cloud and lots of great open source projects, um, a WebAssembly was born in being a standard that everybody can build on. And it originally came out of that skunk works that was Mozilla, you know, the creators of Rust. Um, and they had this vision for um, a basically a simple CPU a little tiny virtual machine that you can put in anything. Uh, and this um, little idea has grown into this incredible community and is now supported across all major browsers, all major chipsets. So it was another idea that may have been designed for the web, but our belief is that the impact across the edge and um, servers and you know, server-side development um, will uh, far exceed what you can do just inside the web. Because now that we have a universal CPU that runs the same everywhere, we have the ability to write software that can truly run anywhere. And this is an open standard with participation by um, organizations everywhere. So WebAssembly is only the fourth language for the web. And just to be clear, but I think back to your point, WebAssembly is governed by W3 at this point? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's uh, there's a governing body that's called the Bytecode Alliance. That's the sort of steward leader of the community. They um, pull together organizations such as Cosmonic, um, uh, Microsoft, and uh, lots of other orgs pulled together to sort of uh, strategize. However, the standard, just like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, is run by the W3C, and that gives Chrome and Safari and Firefox and uh, Edge the ability to have a common building point for building this. And this is not you know, science fiction. This is fact. This is here today. This was proposed years ago, and right. now we live in this world where um, industry suddenly has a universal open source virtual machine that's already running everything. Everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it's really, you think of it like an OS. It's because it's, we're, we're starting right at the beginning, right? Um, and, uh, and Adobe's a big, big, big user of WebAssembly. So all of our web-based creative products and Acrobat, you know, Photoshop, that kind of stuff, that, that if you have that web experience, that's using WebAssembly. Got it. So this is all great. Rubber meets the road, and I want our audience to kind of really wrap their head around this now. William, you mentioned a bunch of organizations, you know, that are using w w WISM. 
but Wasm, yeah. Wasm, excuse yeah. me. But explain to the audience now where where does Rob what what are the applications they're using with this where it really Look, look, let's you know, the talk about app, if you will. Well, let's talk about WebAssembly in a couple different ways because first, it's the technology that you don't need a strategy to adopt. Right. Uh, because it's become so ubiquitous already. For example, if you're using any of Adobe's incredible products that they've moved to the edge for performance, for security, for ease of use, um, you're already using WebAssembly. If you're using things like Google Earth or if you're using design tools like Figma, all of those amazing experiences are built on this. And WebAssembly is even being embedded into other software platforms. Yeah, so a big, big example, Amazon Prime Video, right? That they, uh, there was a, they had a great blog post, and that's why Amazon's actually part of the Bytecode Alliance. I, I believe it, one of the reasons they're part of it. Mm -hmm. But when they update their apps on embedded, you know, it's really an embedded play, right? Right. It's, it's well, we're going we're gonna to take all our C++ code, and we're going to make a WebAssembly module, and that's going to be the, the unit of, one of the units of deployment. Really, really fascinating stuff. I love it. And that's why it's such a big, it's so, it's so hard to talk about WebAssembly from, a, from a, you know, starting at ground zero because it's, it's just, it's so huge, right? It's such yeah, a the diverse prime, thing. The Prime article was fascinating because they talked about the challenge of supporting over 8,000 unique devices and CPU combinations. So think like your Samsung television, your iPad, you know, uh, all the whole plethora of diversity. I'll give you another company, Epix. I don't know yeah. if you're familiar with Epic's channel, whatever. It's a channel, but it's a streaming service. It's a lot of things. And I had this conversation with them. They, because they play on everything and anything. Actually, some of it through Prime, actually. But if you're, if yeah. yeah, exactly. If you're a company and you're looking at this edge today, you know, you're saying, wow, how do I support this incredible array of devices? How do I get as much reuse out of my code? And WebAssembly becomes this sort of standard deployment mechanism. Now, I think your question was as well, if we have this new, you know, I think each age of computing has been defined by some market leading app or experience. And your question was, well, what's the killer app for this, this question? I'd actually maybe turn it around a little bit. If you look at the breadth and diversity of who's adopting WebAssembly, um, the killer app for the cloud was probably AWS. It was a platform that you could use to build your own experiences. No yep. And I think that the killer app of WebAssembly will be a platform that enables other organizations to build their own dreams and visions. And that's what I hope we've done with Wasm Cloud or open source. Right. You know, we launched this. All in, right, in, now we're at the core on. of the onion. Come yeah. on, come on, you know. The, now uh, we uh, got NBC. it. I'll uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> No, no, it's uh, all good. When, when we started this uh, vision, we saw an opportunity with, uh, with WebAssembly, and our market leading position comes from the fact that we had incredible management that saw the value and the necessity for something that's going to be that transcendental and that important to be open source, because um, it needs shared governance, it needs community, and that was why as soon as we hit you know, a dozen developers, we put a Wasm Cloud into the CNCF. And from there, it has exploded to over 120 core contributors alone. We have people like Intel and BMW contributing TensorFlow and Onyx, um, a Microsoft Onyx, which is another machine learning framework mm -hmm. um, models to the community. And that's something that when it's put in there, folks like Adobe could pick it up and use it, for example. And so the, uh, to the question of what is our killer app for WebAssembly, I think it's going to be defined by the platforms that everyone uses to build their own experience. And I think with a real difference between AWS, which was ultimately with, you know, virtual machines, right? All the, all the paths, or all the infrastructure service. It's now, it's a real challenge, and it's a challenge for these for the big vendors because it's, what is, is it functions as service? Is it like Lambda? Or is it like Lambda at Edge? Is it like, uh, is it like you know, ECS, right? Where they have, uh, where you kind of give them a container and they run it. So it's like, well, it's really all that, right? And, it, and, and where it runs almost doesn't matter anymore. And so it's very hard because they've set up these silos in these companies. Oh, you're the, you're the Edge people, right? Oh, you're the Compute people. It's like, well, it, it cuts across all of that. So it's a real I think it's a real challenge moving forward for the big, the big vendors. Well, and I think there's two really important facts that your audience should learn when we, when we think about that, uh, Colin. Thank you. I think that was uh, very important. The first is, is that a lot of the silos that we build in today are walled gardens. And a Lambda and Lambda Edge are incredible products, and they're built by an awesome company with a team. 
but it's still but a walled won't. garden. There's no you doubt. Can't take that, you can't take that across that distributed edge or into your own fleet or your own devices. So again, we're back to better together in community. And the second opportunity here that is a little bit more nuanced is, is that because now we're talking about shifting the cost of compute across that distributed edge, this technology is going to open the market to entirely new business models. When you no longer have to pay for compute, you can have the compute spin up in a user's browser and have them run the microservices there, you suddenly enable new peer-to-peer -peer businesses or even new hub-and-spoke businesses that are... Oh, you, you've just changed, just, the, you changed the model. You changed it's the a cost whole model. different yeah. cost model, right? I mean, because one of the things that I think enabled cloud adoption wasn't just... Yes, it was virtual machines. Yes, it was AWS that made it kind of, I don't want to say easy because God knows it's not, but, but that made it palatable for everyone to swallow, right? Sure. Um, but also there was a cost model. As a matter of fact, you look at the whole FinOps thing that was here <laughs> Monday, right? You yeah. see how big that was? Because this cost model is spiraled out of control. Most people don't even have a handle on it. Right? Yeah. Right? I, I think that is an indicator species that there's a problem. Of course you know, it is. Uh, you know, when you have a whole cottage industry developing around... It's not a cottage anymore. It's not yeah. a cottage industry, it's right? Huge. It's a requirement. It's a yeah. huge if you're, if you're in the, the business of cloud today, you are also in the business of, you know, grooming your cloud cost and managing your garden. But that screams yeah. to me, we need something better. better. We need a better mousetrap here. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and I think, now Docker's great, and it's going to be around for a long time, but it, it allowed that lift and shift, like you started with, it allowed people to take things that were not made for Docker, not made for Kubernetes, and just kind of throw it in a container, okay, we're done, right? Mm -hmm. And it's incredibly expensive and incredibly inefficient and not made for it. But with WebAssembly, you, can't, you, you, you cannot do that. It is a, it's, a, it's its own OS, right? It's its own tool chain to compile into from, all the, from these languages. And so it's almost, it's, it's, it's a different kind of challenge. And it's gonna, we're gonna see who can do it and who can't. It's gonna be really so interesting. So I, you know, I, I may have a different, viewpoint on this then you guys are a different opinion in my mind almost from the day IAAS infrastructure service came out we were talking about its demise everyone was saying oh, this is a fine waypoint on the way to the real cloud which is going to be pass mm -hmm. right platform mm -hmm. as a service and we had Heroku and and some really good early uh you know tries at this sure I think the fact of the matter is Docker and containers became the past that our grandfather told us, or not our grandfather, but <laughs> our uncle told us about, right? That, yeah. be, that became the de facto past built on top of infrastructure as a service. And it's great. It served us. I mean, look, there's a whole big industry around this and yeah. Kubernetes and all that. But with, with the advent of the edge and, and these other kind of places besides cloud, it may very well be that this translates to that, right? You can have Kubernetes on the edge and all of these things. But it's a, it's a, it's kind of like re reshuffling the deck a little bit, right? And let's see what comes out this time. The, the, the deck's been reshuffled. And, and what I would uh, observe if we take up to the 50,000-foot view is, is that with each epic of computing, we've had dominant vendors. Let's yep. come back to the 90s and think about, you know, uh, Microsoft. Dell and... Uh, Microsoft and um, uh, and think about the early rise of the edge or the of virtualization with VMware. Um, uh, their dominance giving way to AWS. The next epic of computing around containers and Kubernetes opening the aperture to Microsoft, Google, and this broader set of and, and the other cloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The broader Those set the of clouds uh, 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 around the world. Um, uh, but uh, this next epic of computing will also have titans that rise and titans that fall. Oh, and, um, it always is. And look, people still run AS 400s. IBM's still a thing. You know, uh, those uh, people will get to an epic, and they the will. Mainframe still keeps that right. stock price where it is. Yeah. Don't yeah. keep yeah. yourself. Look, right. they will. <laughs> they, they they will get there. But we will also see a rise of whole new companies, whole new applications. Absolutely. And and here's something else based I've on learned. this new reality. Yeah. Right. So I grew up in the Wintel, you know, empire, right? It was yeah. an evil empire to some, not evil to others, but it was Wintel, yeah. right? Uh, the, the advent of, of virtualization, if I would, when we first started, let's be honest, right? We're, I don't know how old you are, but him and I are of an age. When we first started talking about VMs, 
it wasn't necessarily VMware. There were some other sure there were. hypervisors that were really good. Yeah, Zen and uh, yeah, they were, well, they were well, open source yeah. hypervisors. Well, VMware that, wasn't even open. Yeah, right. But it became the dominant player. At least you know. A lot of the public clouds didn't go VMware by default, no. right? They went open. But anyway, VMware would not probably have been the the, the odds-on favorite in the race for which hypervisor rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazon Web Service probably wouldn't have been the odds-on favorite for which public cloud becomes the 800-pound gorilla. A bookstore of all things, right? A, a bookstore, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would have bet Google. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just... But this is why I'm still doing this. <laughs> anyway, um, I think as we look now at WebAssembly, Edge, and you're right, there are going to be winners and losers. There'll be some big winners if this thing really becomes the the new frontier, the new place where we live. Yeah. You know, in, in the metasphere, I guess is the word now, right? Um, they're going to be winners. And as we sit here today, we can make bets. But, it, you know... Companies are going to arise, applications are going to arise, usages are going to arise that maybe we haven't even really, really thought about yet. Mm -hmm. right? It may be with Wasm Cloud, but man, put it in some, some person out here's hands. You're absolutely right. And they come up with something that, you know, well, game changing. Look, you know, I, I think that I love the analogy of uh, a closed company like VMware, which is a phenomenal, successful business. Absolutely. Great and business. In not independent again. And Amazon, uh, which is built on open source and built on. Community. Yes, it was. You know, uh, they have some awesome proprietary technology. And the, the reality is, is the vast majority of the software that you uh, build or you buy is still uh, mostly made up of open source. And mm -hmm. I think that those trends um, will continue. So I think that when we're looking for the seeds of the revolution, we should start with um, uh, the big open source players and the movements uh, because that's going to germinate. Now, it may be picked up by some proprietary player and um, manifest itself as a PaaS that's closed, but it's still going to be built uh, with, together yeah. with the community. I, so I'm going to disagree with you with all due respect. Absolutely. <laughs> I think the open source train has left the station, and to overtake that train, you're going to need some kind of hyper missile or something. I mean, because there's so much momentum, there's oh, so I, much. Yeah, I mean, think on the same page then, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we'll be open source. So, so they're in. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, I cut myself this morning, and I'm worried that I'm bleeding, but it's, it's okay. okay. I don't think it's getting okay. picked up. Um, so anyway, um, but I think that's. I mean, all the, the so web, you know, Wasm Cloud is definitely the leader here. There's a lot of companies that have, you know, that are op um, that entered the space. Every single one of them, first thing they do, an open source project. You have to today. Yeah, yeah. It it is the de facto business model. Today. It builds better software, right? Yeah. If you want, um, and when we think about that, this is diversity is our strength. When you think about the reasons why open source builds better software, it's because you have more opinions, more perspectives. It's tested against broader use cases. It's transparent. So, you know, everybody knows where the bodies are buried. You know, you know where things are strong and where things are weak. Um, and it gives you the ability to collaborate. Um, and I think what's awesome about, you know, we're at a, essentially a, a Linux Foundation event here, uh, which is a foundation machine uh, that creates incredible properties such as the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. With organ in part, well, open source with transparent community and governance really is the accelerant that wins. And you look at Kubernetes, you look at Istio, Wasm Cloud, you look at all of these projects, there is a broad theme there of collaboration. I'm going to tell you what else is important. And this is me, right? So 30 years in the 30 plus years in the business. I think one of the unspoken strengths of this model is the lack of salespeople. I, and I, I yeah. look, I'm a salesperson at heart. You'll always be closing too. But here's the thing. I spent the first 15 or 20 years, 25 years of my career hiring salespeople. I paid them a lot of money. Yeah. And they worked like hell to sell technology. Today, I don't know if I would hire, you know, quote unquote salespeople if I'm selling technology solutions yeah. because today and the whole the real power or one of the real powers behind the open source revolution is get the software into people's hands let them use it 
deliver delight, show them it works, they'll buy it. Yeah. I uh, don't need some and, guy hawking you. And also the nice thing is that WebAssembly and the browser is already a big thing. It's already an That's established thing. That's what I'm thing. saying. You so don't what need they a say, sales guy right. for that. So they're just going to say, well, why can't I run this in the data center too? I made this great WebAssembly module. Why code, not? Right. And now baked in. And that is, that is one of the important things, right? You don't have to mothball your, your data center. Nope. That's right? right. It's yeah. part of this. You want to call it a mesh. You want to call it a web. You want to whatever you, your, your infrastructure. Yeah. Right? It, it, it's kind of Borg-like. No, no pun intended to our friends at Google and Borg and uh, Kubernetes, but, but it is kind of, you know, we will assimilate you. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, I think your, your uh, motion on the bottoms up uh, go to market, you know, developer to developer, you know, let's just emulate our inner bombers here. There's three people that matter in software choices. It's developers, 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 yeah. right? <laughs> it's um, true, but that's the world today. It is, it is. And it's a persona that's building and communicating software to themselves, to other other developer personas. And th that's even the way that Colin and I met. I mean, I had no idea that Adobe was even using Wasm Cloud until we get this, you know, inbound email to hop on a hop on a call and you blew my mind in the first call with what you guys were doing internally. It was incredible. And the whole team was just like Wow, that's awesome! And we've had that that same experience with our community um, to talk about the strategic choices for us to start open, to start building together with BMW. You know, as another example, BMW just came to KubeCon EU and they talked about how they're putting Wasm Cloud um, into their um, uh, cars early in production and running machine learning models that can transcend um, boundaries, you know, that can run across their proprietary OpenStack or data centers or Kubernetes, their cloud instances, but also directly in the vehicles themselves. And that's a, a real power that continues to build better models there. I get it. Guys, this may not, you're not gonna, we're, we're over 30 minutes for our 15 minute it. interview. But so I, I've got to wrap, wrap up. But in wrapping up, I'd like to bring this up. First of all, WASM is W A S M Cloud, and the website is WASMCloud.com. WASMCloud.com. That's the main site. And then Cosmonic.com. Cosmonic Can we've you got spell that for us, sure. too, Um We thought, why be stuck in the clouds when you come to space? Right. Uh, okay. So a Cosmonic is just like the Cosmos. C O S M O N I C. Cosmonic.com. I love it. Adobe. You know, <laughs> That's Adobe, an easy yeah. One. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we would love to hear more about what Adobe's doing with WebAssembly. That that is, and you know, I'm gonna look. We're here now, but um, we do TechStrong TV three times a week, guys. Sure, Anytime, great. Great. you know, maybe we need a WebAssembly regular. Sh I'll talk to you about this. Yeah, let's do that. Um, anyway, we're gonna wrap up. I hope you enjoyed this extended interview. Uh, do check out Cosmonic Wasm Cloud. Wasm Cloud. I, I think it could really, if, if you know, in your career going forward, you're going to need to know that.